we're back. Hello and welcome to the return of Rugby League Back Chat, where for the rest of the season we'll be talking the good, the bad and indeed the ugly of all things at Rugby League. Joining me today are indeed the good, the bad and the ugly too, but I'll let you decide which one is which. First, Maurice Lindsay, the former Chief Executive of Super League and the RFL and the former Chairman of Wigan. Phil Kaplan, the editor of 4020 magazine and Martin Sadler the editor of League Express. Let's get straight into it because there is plenty to discuss this week, gentlemen. I think we'll start with the Witness Vikings who, after many trials and tribulations of their own, are finally on sound footing for now, uh, having come out of administration and avoided the, ret uh, the threat sorry, of liquidation. Uh, Martin, I'll come to you first. It's been a, a tough old couple of weeks for Witness Vikings, but they're finally somewhere comfortable. Sure. Um, What's been your take on the whole saga and uh, how witness have found themselves? Well, the first thing is, um, Matthew, I was glad to see a crowd of almost 6,000 there on, on Sunday. And I was also glad to see them winning. Apologies to Featherstone fans. But, you know, when you're in that position, you, 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 you're coming back to life, so to speak. You want to start with a bang, don't you? And there were, there were 28 nil up at, um, at half time and, and, and ultimately won 44 22. So that was a great result for them. Obviously, they've lost quite a few players, and earlier this week, Liam Hood was, was the latest to leave. But none of us really know how much um, money and resources that the, the new consortium have behind them. But they brought some fans onto the board, haven't they? And, you know, the, the independent fans organisation race is six-figure sum. So that, that looks promising, but whether they can ever get back to anything like the old days when, of course, in, in your day, Morris, they used to, it was Widnes and Wigan, wasn't mm, it? Some, some great matches you had with them back in, you know, 89 when they were World Club champions. It's a tough ask to get back to those days. Indeed. I mean, Vince Karelius uh, was a dynamic leader for them then, and Dougie Lawton was probably the best recruiter yeah. in the game. He brought on wonderful players including Martin Afire, Jonathan Davis, you need it, you name it. Um, but you know we can't trade on memories these days. They've got a smashing stadium, they've got a very very honest set of supporters but they need to build and get the finances right otherwise there'll be another Bradford. I think they've gone about the resurrection the right way. They seem to have brought in eight people who passionately care about the club. We haven't got the details yet of the depth of their pockets which obviously is vitally important. Survival for this year is one thing and with a 12 point deduction, uh, obviously six now because they won three games, it's still going to be more about fighting relegation than making the top five and heaven knows what would happen if they were to go down to League One. But I think we're missing one of the major issues here and that is what is the cause? Um, mm. And we look at clubs like Hull KR but for the largesse of their chairman Neil Hudgill and the fantastic support of seven or 8,000 people every week while they were in the championship, they would have been in similar straits. We look at Lee, who very nearly went to the wall. We now look at Widnes. All of this is to do with relegation. Uh, and again, the, the, almost the, uh, the elephant in the room is, can rugby league in its current state afford promotion relegation in the tradi traditional British sense? Or have we moved on? It's like you say, tradition doesn't pay the bills. Mm. Do we need to look at ourselves as a sport, stop comparing ourselves to other sports that might operate in that way and say, what is the picture for rugby league going forward to stop this happening to clubs like Witness? I, I can tell that you're keen on abolishing a promotion and relegation, and you might you might have a good argument. Just saying it needs to be discussed. Well, I think it has been for many years, <clears throat> but I honestly think that it's not just that. I think that all sports now, and I include football, I include soccer, uh, it's all about the Premier League, mm. the top division of any sport, whether it's cricket or whatever you want to consider. Um, all the money goes into there, the sponsorship goes into there, the television money goes into there. And it doesn't fund a lower competition, so the players don't want to go, they don't want to be full-time. It's very difficult for those clubs. And when you get famous clubs like Bradford and Widnes, whole KR, Little Threatened, it's clearly a worry, but we are what we are. Morris, some of the Super League clubs and you know people like Ian Lennigan and so on at Wigan, They've said that with the next TV deal coming up from 2022, they might um, support the idea that, that less money goes to the Championship and League One clubs and virtually all the money goes to, goes to the Super League clubs next time. I know there's a bit of a formula that's going to determine that, but, but nonetheless, I mean, would you support that, that 
you know, virtually all the <coughs> all the money that comes from the broadcast deal ought, ought to go to Super League and virtually none to the rest of the game. Well, having started my life with Wigan in my first week when we got relegated in the lower division, I know that you can't abandon a club just because it goes down. You have to help mm. them to get back. And looking at the plights of Bradford and, and currently Witness, we, we've got to be very careful. But is there enough resources, both financial and playing-wise, to justify um, 12, 14 clubs in, in, in a Premier Division and another set of clubs who want to be there? Mm. Are, are we not just staring off eventual disaster? But isn't but, there a natural break now as well that we have teams that are and can sustain full-time? And clubs who will always be part time, but vital parts of their community, but, but, which is something that the sport itself has always been rightly but, very proud of. But Phil, the the problem is, surely um, I'll put the question to you: How do you uh, promote that to Halifax supporters, to Feverston supporters, to supporters of Lee Centurions now, who are ultimately you, you, you part do, of that? You do it on two levels. One is you give them competitions that they can win that are prestigious, and I think we saw that with Batley when they won the Northern Rail Cup. That it was a massive regeneration. For that club, it was, yeah. I think they had a chairman as well who openly and honestly said at the beginning, "We're not looking to be a Super League club, but winning a trophy and the prize money that goes with it that sustains us for the future and what we do in our community." But I, I, I don't think it's mutually exclusive that you say you don't necessarily have a, an element of promotion and relegation, but you acknowledge the fact that there is a full-time element and a part-time element to, to move from one to the other. Halifax would get the kind of backer that would take them full time. I think one of the good things that, that, that we've done this year is bring back the top five system for, for the, you know, leading mm. leading to a grand final. I've always liked that system personally. Mm. We introduced it, didn't we, in 1998 when, when, when you Absolutely. were in charge, mm. you know, when, when we first moved to have a grand final. And it was a tremendous success in those days, Morris. I and thought easily because understood. Easily understood. The the, the 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 interesting thing about it was that the crowds for playoff games were bigger than the crowds for regular season games. Yes, indeed. Um, that's not been the case in in, no. in recent years. God bless Mr. We, we extended it to eight play <laughs> eight teams, didn't we? And it, I think it'd have extended it to twenty if you possibly well, could. Well, well, the, the, NR, the, the NRL, NRL are doing this now. The that. NRL have brought this wild card round in, where effectively a team that finishes tenth in the NRL under this new concept can somehow win the NRL grand final, yeah. which, you know, they, they are following our lead and well, there is much just, of, there's much of Super League following but, the NRL. One of the other things you it? also introduced was the double header at Old Trafford. Mm -hmm. So you have the divisional premiership final right. as well as what was the premiership yeah. final. And again, as a day out, generating money for the lower clubs, for them, mm. for a club like Sheffield to win yes. their first trophy, that was massive. I think we've lost that over the last mm. few years. I think that was sad because if you remember, we had Hull there mm. and uh, Brian Smith was coaching Hull at the time and it was a tremendous success for them and really uh, gave, them, gave them a springboard. Um, but we mustn't think back too much. We mm. must concentrate on what, we're, what we've got to live with now all the games that are competing with us who are marching on, I can tell you that a lot of kids come out of university and they want to be sports administrators, a lot of marketing officers, they're lifting their game, the players are fitter, the players are faster, uh, in all sports, not just ours. So we've got a, we've got a battle on our hands. I, th I think it, Morris makes a good point, actually. Um, we are in a position where we need to look at what's going on now. And one thing we don't know about Witness yet is how exactly they found themselves in this issue. Um, they are a club that, according to Chris Price, who's part of the new membership, uh, new board, were 24 hours away from liquidation. Now, this isn't the first time we've heard this in, in the last two years. Barrow, Keighley, York have all been in very similar situations. Bradford were liquidated. Mm. So what does the sport need to do to make sure this doesn't keep happening? Because it seems to me that the processes that are currently happening and deciding how clubs are managed isn't working. So what? Well, Martin one thing we need to do, to do is, uh, is 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 have a process whereby we can ensure that clubs are not trading insolvently, because that sounds to me as though that must have been happening. Well, when Nigel in was in cases. charge, he said he had that system in place. Well, yes. Well, well but it must have been written on invisible ink, <laughs> because uh, I've run businesses yeah. all my life, quite apart from sporting interests. And Martin's been to my um, head offices in in New York, strange enough, and. We, I have an accountant who, with his assistant, work on nothing but the monthly management accounts. So it's my his job to prepare them, my job to analyse them. I can tell you three months in advance if we're heading for any trouble. Mm. So if you can see that in the fourth month of the season, 
you put it right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't and go out and risk buying another scrum half just because you might win again. And this does is the thing we've win, though, but Sorry, Phil. A sorry. supposed live salary cap. Mm -hmm. You know, how can we say we've got one when a club like Wigan is having points deducted from it 18 months after the original offence took place? If the new people that have come in at Widners have told the administrators that there's a thousand pounds in the bank, mm -hmm. how can some of the contracts that we know Widners players are on? have been registered and uh, all of that needs looking at. Sure. And let's not forget um, Morris, Widness very late in the, in the off-season signed Anthony Gellin who will naturally be one of their bigger earners and Chris Nino, what you're saying is you, you can foresee when financial trouble are coming, surely that would have been the case at Widness, they would have seen when those players were signed onto deals, it was only around the turn of the year. Is it good management, that's what you've got to say, mm -hmm. possibly not but and I understand the chairman, I've been one. They are so desperate and they're under pressure from their fans, their local press, national press. They want to get out of the jam that they're in and they risk something and take a chance and indeed very often put their own money into which mm -hmm. they were to be admired. But at the end of the day, no, you need strict financial controls. Yeah, and it's very difficult, isn't it, to admit that you're struggling actually in, mm. in, in sport. You, know, you, can't, lose you can't really yeah, you, know, you can't really come out and say, oh, look, we're we're heading for trouble. Because then everybody piles in on you, I, I suppose. I know a lot of people criticise James Rule, the chief executive of Widners, for, for for what they claim, you know, to have painted a too optimistic and rosy picture, uh, you know, th throughout last year, um, and particularly when you know they were talking about uh, getting the parachute payment from from Super League, which you know they were following a year after Lee had had that parachute payment of half a million. Um, it, it, it didn't give any indication that they were heading for, you know, mm. heading for the rocks, so to speak. But it, as I say, I've got some sympathy with him because you, it, it's difficult to, mm. it's difficult to do that. And um, you know, you, 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 people back off you, of course. Can you say to you, Mr. Chairman, uh, we've started off on a very downbeat. <laughs> well, I was, I was, can I just finish? Yes. This year, the game has started off in a sensational manner. Mm -hmm. I've not been as excited for a long, long time. I've watched every game. I'm knocked out. I went to the <laughs> World Club Championship. Mm -hmm. um, that was a breathtaking game because I can tell you that the Sydney Roosters were exhausted by the end of the game, but so were Wigan and paying the price now. But that game has led to everything else. So Warrington a player. I went to see Warrington play this. I thought, wow, here's the new champions. Mm -hmm. Then I saw St. Helens. I thought, no, no, hang on. This lot will do it. It's fantastic. And this weekend... Wakefield Trinity blew my socks off with that performance. Yeah. So it's not all downbeat. We've got plenty to look forward Absolutely. to. Absolutely. Yeah. And we'll be talking about the Lions very, very shortly. Just quickly to wrap this up. Uh, Widness are now on minus six. Uh, so the bottom of the championship. Realistically on the field, what, what Phil can they look to achieve? What can they realistically achieve this year? Because there are still suggestions with the squad they got. They can still push for the playoffs despite that. Is that realistic Provided they can hold on to the young talent. I mean, they, they've built themselves this year around a core of academy-based players. I think it was 11 of the 17 that played against Featherstone this week. That's phenomenal, but they have to hold on to them. And I'm just not sure they've got that experience to get further up the league to, to challenge the playoffs. What they need is to target Swinton, Rochdale, and Dewsbury and, not, and not get relegated. It's hold on to the on crowds to. as well, isn't it? Hopefully the people of Witness will continue to back them. But uh, I agree with Morris, though, what he's saying, that there are some great things in the game, so let's not get too... You <laughs> no, know, no, no, no. The reason, the reason I love Morris when Morris was the chief exec was that he used to have this ability to talk the game up. And I, I, that's we enjoy what we all need to not? do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one thing I'm sure that we're all very happy about is the return of the Lions which was announced finally on Monday. There's a four-game series. Tonga uh, is the start. That's played in Hamilton on October the 26th. And then the two tests against the Kiwis, November the 2nd and November the 9th in Auckland and Christchurch. And then we wrap up with a game in PNG against the Cummels in Port Moresby on November the 16th. Phil, as the uh, the man who probably loves international rugby more than, than anyone, uh, how delighted are you that the Lions are back on the international calendar? I think we owe a huge debt of gratitude to Tonga. I think they've changed the picture over the last two years, what they did in the 2017 World Cup, the elevation of the Pacific nations, the fact that there's a Pacific tournament running alongside these is absolutely fantastic. I don't think we should get too hung up that we're not playing Australia. The last tour we went on, we didn't. Uh, I don't think we should get too hung up that it's England by another name. I think the Lions brand does have a resonance to it. and. I'm told uh, by Kevin Sinfield that in 2007, when the Lions last played, they were all English players anyway. I do think there needs to be a representation of Wales, Ireland, Scotland. I was pleased that when the press release came out, all of those chairmen were quoted. 
doesn't necessarily have to be a player. I'd perhaps like to see John Keir on the, the coaching staff representing Wales. Um, International Rugby League has to be our driver. Morris is exactly right that there are some positive things going on on the field at the moment. I'd throw Catalan's performance in against Warrington this week, as again being one of the games of the season, really enjoyed that. But if we're really honest, we're, we're still resonating amongst ourselves. We're not having that final push towards the national media and some of our stories and great players like Tom Johnson breaking into the areas we need them to. What's going to do that is International Rugby League. We've got the germination of a calendar here, which we need now to roll out over the next four, five, six, seven years so everybody knows who's playing when. My slight reservation is we're not doing the same in the Northern Hemisphere. We've lost a real chance to have a, mm. a an international mid-season weekend this year. It's disappeared. What are we seriously going to do about elevating France, Wales, Scotland and Ireland so that we can have something that matches what's going on in the Pacific. Well, Martin and Morris, just hold your thoughts because we will talk about that after a short break. Plenty to talk about, including, of course, more about the Lions and then everything that's going on in the Super League and the lower leagues. And we're also going to get Morris's thoughts and the rest of the panel's thoughts on what is going on with the current state of Super League and how it's trying to position itself. So we'll be back right here very shortly on Rugby League Back Chat. Welcome back to Rugby League Back Chat. Before the break, we were talking about the return of the Lions, and the Lions are indeed back, Morris. Uh, they will play Tonga, New Zealand and Papua New Guinea. There have been some criticisms, though, that there's no Australia. Is that really important that the Lions aren't playing Australia, or should we be happy that we are playing the likes of Tonga and Papua New Guinea? More than happy. Um, <clears throat> if, it, if it was like the old days where we only had New Zealand, Australia... Great Britain and a little bit of France. The international press didn't want to know us. Uh, London press didn't want to know us. When we had the 1995 World Cup and we brought in Tonga, Samoa, Fiji, Papua New Guinea, everybody that added new players that we'd never seen before, the international press went whoosh, well, this is good, let's have some of this. And we had packed grounds as well. So I'm all in favour of helping those clubs and you watch those Tonga boys because they could beat Australia, never mind us. No, they nearly beat England in the World Cup semi-final, didn't they, Martin? What, what's your thoughts on the the lack of Australia in this tour? Is it is it something that needs to be addressed moving forward? Do we need do, does there need to be an Ashes series at some point? Well, there will be work there next uh, mm. next next year, I believe. So you know they are coming over here. Um, and fine, I mean, I, I, I'm perfectly happy to see us playing the Kiwis. I wish it was a three test series rather than a two test series, but you know, it's great that we're going. We're going to be playing them in Auckland and, and Christchurch, but playing Tonga in, in, in Hamilton and then uh, PNG in Port Moresby, it's going to be a great tour for the players who are selected. And I think as well, I've got a triple header. Uh, so, although we are not directly playing Australia on the same weekend, they're playing Tonga, Britain they? play New Zealand, mm -hmm. Australia play Tonga, Fiji play Samoa. As a, an international sports fan, why wouldn't you want to be at Eden Park? And, and I think that? not playing Australia actually increases your, you know, your Focus anticipation on, yeah. mm. for next year's tour. So, you know, we... I think by then that'll be the battle for the number one nation Yeah, as probably, well, which, hopefully. Which again, well, getting adds closer. Layer. Yeah. Getting closer, obviously, with that 9-0, with that 6-0 result that we had up in Brisbane. But exactly. I, I don't think you'll ever get Australia's respect. Well, you never get it anyway, ever. <laughs> But you'll, you'll, you won't get as much as you need until you beat them. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're getting closer. And as you just said, Phil, if we do that, whoosh, and we're the number one, then you watch a British press lift to, off. To get closer to them, do we need to look at the international game in the Northern Hemisphere? Because I'm still worried that by putting on this Pacific tournament, which again, fantastic for strengthening the likes of PNG, who've got the Hunters in the, the Queensland competition. Mm. Fiji are going to have a team in the New South Wales competition. Mm. Do we even as Super League need to look at a second French team being in the competition to enable us to get that international We've had that debate for years and... Toulouse haven't been able to come up with the players. Mm. I mean, we started with uh, 
press on Germain, but they were all Australian players. Mm -hmm. We need a player support line in France to be able to do that. I think your main selling point in the UK is Super League. Let's not kid ourselves. Absolutely. That's where the star players are. That's where the exciting players are. And that's the one that will come through the TV screen. If you think Barney Francis down in London is going to pay you millions to watch Mediocre, think again. Mm. But you need to get, get stars get through it. that television screen, and that's through Super League. As for international, it'll come, but I'm afraid we've, we've got no countries up here. Phil, 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 one thing we'll, I want to say, do you think we'll get more interest from a French broadcaster if we had a second team playing in Super League? So every week they had a home game that they could focus on. Well, the route, that, the route is one. there, isn't it, for to for to lose? I mean, yeah, they've just yeah. they've got to win the competition yeah. and, and get promoted now. So, but that's you know. the argument. Can we wait for them to win the competition? But well, it can't be just a romantic film. You can't no, think all no, oh, of a good team I do sit in the idealist camp. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, sadly, <laughs> that's been going on for a hundred years, and it's got us nowhere. Let's get into the new century and let's battle with the big boys in sport with mm. what we can be good at. But I feel surely, surely, just on that, I. It's okay, I know what you're saying, get Toulouse up, but this has been tried before. Toulouse quite openly say they're not ready. Sylvain Hull's the Toulouse coach says they aren't ready for Super League. Now, the last time I can remember some, a, a team being handpicked to go up to Super League was the Celtic Crusaders. Now, that didn't go very well, so surely we but, can't go down that route. But I still maintain that if we'd have backed the Celtic Crusaders, and let's face it, when they were denied a licence, they'd made the playoffs in Super League. How strong would we have a domestic Welsh team now? And I, I also go back to the fact that when Celtic Crusaders were at their height, uh, if the stories are be, to be believed, they had Gavin Henson um, and Andy. Well, the, the thing is, Phil, ready though, to come in, you, you, but they needed dispensation you, you, on the salary cap and didn't get it from other clubs. So again, is this another yeah. dichotomy deciding what is best for the sport as a whole rather than an individual? Club? But you can very easily point to lots of situations in the past where rugby league didn't take advantage of opportunities mm -hmm. that seem to arise. Right. As Morris says, that's all in the past now, though. We, we can't really debate we, the Celtic Crusaders. But we, we don't deal with the macro issues. So we, no. can, we can talk about um, changing rules and making the game more entertaining, and that's micro. The macro issues are things like we never implemented frame in the future. No. We never talked about mergers on the basis other than for one weekend they were debated and discussed without any real analysis going into the value uh, years along, but we never really did licensing properly. And my issue again is that if the international game is the driver of all of this, you'd be looking at the talent pool in Ireland, you'd be mm. looking at investors that we know have been mm. in Ireland for a while, you'd be saying, Does Super League over the next five years need a team in Ireland? How do we make that happen? Well, before and you do all, all that, Phil, to international yeah. I have to disagree with you. You're being romantic again. Before you do all that, strengthen the current Super League because that's not yet quite strong enough. No. Right? Let's. You've talked to this morning about the team who finished quite rightly, but the team who finished tenth in the NRL could possibly win the comp. They'd have to have the players good enough to do that, mm -hmm. and they do have the players good enough to do that. You would never get the team finishing tenth in Super League yet. So what we need to do is make that team finishing tenth capable of going to. Uh, St Helens and winning, going to Wigan yeah. and win. You need to make the competition stronger. Absolutely. And at the moment, we've got the top. I was impressed this weekend. We've got probably the top six clubs at the moment very competitive. Let's make it deeper and stronger. Well, Martin, the, well, team, the team that looks like that could come up, or the obvious team that will come up this year, is the Toronto Wolfpack, who obviously do bring something completely different, however you think that good, good or bad, to the to Super League if they were to get there. But there are suggestions. Um, that Super League are a bit uneasy about them coming in because of how it might affect the TV deal. Because well, it might do, but I mean, the, maybe the obvious solution is to go to fourteen teams to you know, so to, to retain twelve teams from England and perhaps two teams from outside England. But but the other point I was going to make, what Morris was saying, was you know, London Broncos are up in Super League this year. Wouldn't it be great? I mean, they've won two games already. Mm. They beat Wigan. At the at the weekend, and they obviously, beat OKR. The, the no, they beat Wake, they beat Wakefield. Wakefield, the, sorry, yes. I mean, you look at where, where Wakefield are playing, and yeah. London beat them. The, the 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 beat Wigan. I think they played Wigan at the right time, not yeah. long after the World Club Challenge. But yeah. nonetheless, it's great to see London doing well. And and you know, if we, if we're going to ever get rugby league back into the pages of the national media, 
a strong London oh, would is, help. is certainly one way, of, one way of mm. doing that. So no. should we have ring-fenced them for this year? No, I don't think no. so. Well, you, you can't do, can you, really? I don't it's, know. It's, 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 a, it's a question of yeah. how do you licence the sport? And but, is but, licensing the way to go? To Morris, 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 if you were um, if you were the chief executive of, of Super League now, what would your thoughts be on the potential inclusion of Toronto Wolfpack or, or any additional overseas side? Well, Last time I was on this programme, I was asked the same question. I said I wouldn't let them in yet. You know, they almost got in, but mm. they slipped up in the last game. But you need to supply local players. You need local fans. You need local youth development. I don't think you can just do it cosmetically by flying in older UK players and making them nearly there. I don't think that'll ever convince the people of the UK. That's how Paris Saint-Germain failed because they had no dynamic French players to rely upon and no youth development and it was pretty much a cosmetic exercise however we've shown that we can produce a few French players not enough but a few and they're doing well for um, the Catalans now as for Toronto I do hope they make it but we are dependent on that I'm on a, a single man to keep his enthusiasm and his finances going but again, do we know what the plan is for the North American continent? Can they survive on their own? Let's say they do get promoted. Probably not. As a sport, should we now be thinking about the you want to another team there. supported? To have a local derby. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and then the television deal may be slightly lesser here, but there's the potential for a higher one globally. Well, it happened but with again, soccer, that, didn't it? Because yeah. everybody laughed at soccer. All of a sudden, you know, some of the big stars over here go over Rooney and... And it's happening in else. China now, again. And, mm. and, uh, indeed. And so you can... Uh, get it going generically in those countries. And I think you make a very good point about the UK audience will be sceptical but what seems to work is that Canadian sport is used to having imported players for yes, all of their they are indeed. So yeah. on things like ice hockey, very they, much so, yeah. whether they're Canadian or not, it doesn't stop the fact. No. And they already have a core of about 8,000. And there is there is a great deal of enthusiasm in Toronto, isn't there? For, there for, for the game. The, the you know, whatever they've done there, they've got a lot of people coming I, I coming think, to the game. And, I think one of the other know, things they've see. done goes back to our perception of how well or not Super League is doing at the moment. They are very, very good at generating stars. Mm. Now, be that the coach who's they got might this produce aura them. about yeah. them, be it Ashton Sims who's got the hair of four. Mm, yeah. you know, they are really good at not only relating mm. the players to the fans, well, but actually giving them the build up star it's, players. It, yeah. it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because Super League started trying to do this itself now. There has been a big, a big drive to to change their marketing ethos and how they present themselves, um, and they have tried to create some more stars with some of the some of the promo stuff they've done. Martin, do, do you think that they're doing it su successfully? What have you made of what what Super League have tried to do down that path so far? Well, I'm not quite sure, you know, what the entirety is of what they're trying to do, but but obviously, any sport in order to be successful has got to generate stars, and it, it's got to create them. It's got to. And, and it's not just a case of, you know, players like Tommy Makinson or Tom Johnson scoring spectacular tries, but you've then got to be able to communicate that to a wider audience because ultimately what makes people want to come and see, um, you know, a, a, a particular sport is that their interest gets sort of piqued by something about the players who, who, who play it. And, you know, before you know it, people will then be coming to see the game in order to see those players so I, th I think whatever whatever Rob is doing and whatever his it, it, you know is the people around him are doing they want we want to do more of it we want to really get get those players you know with a personality that that goes beyond rugby league but, if but I really go back to why it. international rugby league is the driver for all of this very few people other than ourselves had heard of Tommy Makinson Mm. until he performed the way he did for England against New Zealand over three mm. weeks. Not only was he on every national news bulletin, but suddenly he's getting the Golden Boot Award yeah, as well. Yeah. How many people have followed Tommy Makinson back into his St Helens career at the start of this season outside mm. of those of us that watch rugby league every week? I know you're desperate for international rugby league to come back in all its glory. <laughs> I just think that it's, <laughs> we, we, would, we, we would need to like put that. that at the head of the... You're yeah. talking yeah. to an ex-chairman of the international board, you're talking to an ex-manager of the Great Britain Rugby League team. My partnership with Mal really was mm -hmm. very productive. They were I wonderful love it. days. I watched... Phil in Wembley. Yeah, but I don't live off nostalgia. Yeah. I don't know, but I think what, what's really interesting is there's always historical precedent for everything we do in rugby league. And in 1973-74, when the game was arguably at the lowest ebb it's ever been, and we had a change of administrative direction. 
within 15 years of that, we were filling Wembley. Great Britain were a massive story. And Old Trafford, played, actually. The players who played for Great Britain were the superstars mm. of the sport, and it yeah. linked back to the success Wigan were having. But it was driven through well, seeing well, Great Britain well, on well, the Phil, BBC. To, to, to go on to that then, what if you want a more prominent international scene, something's got to give, because mm. we've already got a very, very full calendar. Mm. Uh, the domestic season goes on a lot longer than it, than it ever has. So what changes would you make domestically well, to make space for that internationally? And that's the first thing, if I was Robert Elston, I would have been looking at, and that would be persuading the 12 people who at the moment are determining the role of my job, which must be impossible anyway, because all those 12 people have different aims and objectives. That's that I do we, agree with. That mm. we have to have. Yeah, we, we can't, a, you can't have a company season. run by 12 no. directors. No. But we can't have a 29 game regular season either and do some of the things that we want rugby league to do so that when the next television deal is negotiated, mm. we offer ourselves, particularly as a summer sport, Mm. You, you can't do that starting on the first week of February. <laughs> well, but without going into the little nitty details, um, I entirely agree with you that it's a, it's an abs abject failure to think that a 12-man board can run the game. Mm. You've appointed Robert Elstone. He's got a proven track record. Let him get on with it. He's got a rugby league background. Yeah, he absolutely. played. He was captain of the university. So I, let him go. Let him but, run. But more than can that. Can I just end? I took a few chances when I was chief exec, and I'll just give a big one to you, which I think made a big difference. Of all the things I did, without getting permission, as it were, yeah. um, I changed the five-yard rule to the ten-yard rule, if you remember that. Yeah. Mm. So that instead of lumbering from scrum to scrum and the spectators falling asleep, you had to run back to be in position or you were offside. And Kelvin Skerritt and Andy Platt came to see him, what if you've just killed our careers? I said, we will never get back there in time. I said, make you fitter. Because mm -hmm. the Australians were already doing it, and they were supreme athletes. So all of a sudden, what happened? We became better players, stronger players, faster players, greater stamina. Now, that was something I did on my own. I got my ears whacked, <laughs> but it's lasted, and it's improved the game. Now, Robert has got loads of ideas. Yes, that Some was of those little ones he's come up with, I thought, were insignificant. They're not. They're great. The clock's a good idea. But really... You can only sell your game with players, Phil, yeah. and that's through a TV screen. And I think the other thing that Robert's got is that it's not just an appreciation of the sport of rugby league because he's steeped in it, but he's worked in accountancy. So when we talk about mm. the Widner situation... And he's worked in the Premier and League. He, and he's worked in television. He's worked with Sky. So he's got all the skills we Did, need. Mm. What he needs is the um, a, a ability to do the job yeah. the way he wants to do it. Do you agree with Robert's view that we should have two referees, Morris? Uh, I'm ambivalent about that. Yeah, do you think uh, it's, I mean, you know, with, with, for a game that's chronically short of money, is the best way to spend money by mm. having, you know, having two it's referees? It's just the money, Martin, that makes me sniffy. Um, I don't want to stop the game. No. I want the game to be continuous and flow. Mm. Um, admittedly, if a ball, fellow drops the ball, you have to stop, it's an infringement. But I don't want somebody who thought, oh, I've not been on the television for 10 minutes, I'm going to blow mm. the whistle and do something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it, look, and I think we've got to get to the point where we accept that some referees will make mistakes occasionally. Well, you know, Martin, hold, hold that thought. Sports, that's we, that's we, always the case, isn't it? We need it? to have a quick break and we'll be back very, very shortly to discuss more things going on in the world of rugby league, including Super League, crises at Wigan and Leeds, perhaps. We'll talk about that straight after the break. Welcome back to the final part of this week's Rugby League Back Chat. And we're going to start talking about some of the ongoings in Super League. I think, gentlemen, the biggest or most surprising result of the week was London Broncos defeating reigning grand final champions, the Wigan Warriors. Phil, London, they're showing everyone up who said that they weren't going to win a game all season, aren't they? Two massive results, both home wins, uh, which I think is, is really important. If, if they are to survive, I think that's where uh, they'll, they'll, be, they'll find the bedrock. Uh, to turn that around from um, what, by their own admission, was a very poor defeat at home to Castleford within seven days, 
um, to beat Wigan, to be 10 nil down and beat Wigan. I think that shows the, the spirit that there is in the squad that we knew was there. We just weren't sure that there was the, the quality to see them through week in, week out. I think it's fantastic that Rob Butler, who's come through Medway Dragons, got a chance to play off the bench again this week. Shows about player development in the south of England, something that we haven't really spoken about yet, but participation is something that we need to get right before we can move the game forward. And, and there clearly are players out there in areas other than the traditional ones that we need to give an opportunity to. Um, I do worry a little bit for Wigan at the moment. I, I know that, as Maurice quite rightly says, they're coming off the back of the exhaustion of a World Club challenge. And I don't think we can appreciate how much that takes out of a team. And I think we've seen various English sides at Leeds when they went to Melbourne last year. It really does set back your season, uh, whether you win or lose that game. I, I think um, Wigan will come back though, Phil. I mean, you I'm, know, I'm it, not sure. I, I, well, I think we've got a really interesting time with two of the, the what have been known as the, the leading super. And if Wigan clubs don't come moment. back, other clubs will win something. Won't but they? it's you know, great, you can't, Wigan but can't the, win no, everything. The great, all the time. It's, it's a great right. narrative for I've, the sport. I've seen yeah. this before. Memories fade. What about when Warrington played in the World uh, Club Challenge? and lost the next five Super League mm. games. It, they build up all winter for that World Club Challenge. And in the second half, I was at the game, second half, Wigan put so much effort in, mm. it was bound to hurt them, bound mm. to hurt them, the disappointment. Um, just, I mean, a, just, you know, a, just a physical challenge from those, you know, absolutely. the roosters. You're, you're still very close to events at Wigan. And no, I'm not. Well, you, <laughs> li living near the town, yes. is taking an interest because it's been a yeah. lifelong passion yeah, of yours. So you you watch the team and you've seen the quality of player leave over the last two yeah, seasons. Yeah, that's that have disappointing. You right. hit the nail on the head there. I mean, to lose the lad to uh, John uh, Bateman to Canberra, mm. I think is a big loss. I think the biggest loss of all, and and I signed Lamy, a pal of mine, but to lose Sean Wayne, I think is a real gut wrencher. Mm. Everybody underestimated Sean Wayne in this country because of his forward manner yeah which is brutally honest and lovable i think sure everybody didn't realize the fact that his video analysis and his common sense was outstanding he would make a sensational great britain rugby league coach actually he once allowed me to sit in on one of their video analyses before a game at um at their oral you know mm. training center and uh I've got to say, Morris, it actually went above my head. It was so, I mean, it was yeah. really, it He's was really interesting. Yeah. Very technically, very technically complex, you know, and, and uh, He's I, think, I think you need a PhD to play for Wigan, actually, if you've got that level of But bringing back to your question, no, I coverage. think, I agree with Martin. I think Wigan will come back. Right. I think they'll get over this low. It happens in all yeah. sport. Um, everyone saw Man City slipping up and thought, oh, they've gone and now currently Liverpool. It happens in sport. One, one of the other things that I think is interesting at the moment, which again, you all have a take on that we perhaps don't, is that Wigan have still been undeniably successful, but their crowds have dropped almost by 4,000. I know. What I... is it that the Wigan public want? Because it clearly isn't just mm. success that they don't seem to be buying into it. They've had too much success over the years, Phil, I think. That's one of the things that, you know... Can, can you get that, bored of winning? Can yeah, you think, get bored you of winning? Well, I think you can take it for granted. Mm. I think as a, as a Wiganer, and I, I'm a Wiganer, I think you do start to think, well, I've had it all now, and mm. you're not you're not nervous the night before you go to the game. You can't wait to get there. Mm. Whereas in the great run of the original Wigan with Dean Bell and Sean Edwards and Gregory and everybody else that existed but it tapered tapered and uh, you're probably right it's probably got a got a it might have happened to Leeds they would not that was brilliant that triple and it tapered but the new stadium is probably a part there no I think well, you're right well Morris you've led me on nicely to Leeds because they are another team that are struggling having been comprehensively defeated by Wakefield over the weekend one winning five Martin but what's what's going on at Leeds well we're always tempted to say there's a crisis at a club when it loses <laughs> a few games aren't we that's that's a rugby league mentality it seems to me Sporting the fact is mentality. they've just lost one or two games and um, the previous week they they lost at St Helens by only five points and everybody said Leeds are back just wait you know they're going to show us now how great they are poor old Wakefield going to Leeds next Friday night. That was the the best motivation Wakefield could have had, of course. Mm. And you know, Danny Bruff and Jacob Miller ruled the show on Friday night. And and it strikes me that Leeds have got to decide what to do about the halfback situation because you know mm. it, it it didn't seem to me to work. That they, they brought in um, young Cameron Smith to play at standoff against Wakefield, and you know he obviously wasn't a creative player that, of the sort that they needed. So. 
you know, and, 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 and Wakefield just, you know, they had Bruff playing at his best. I thought, you know, still outstanding at his age. Tom Johnson on the wing was absolutely spectacular. Bill Tupu, the centre, Brilliant. made 270 uh, metres this, you know, in that game, far more than anybody, any other player has made this year. So, so the fact is, rather than saying Leeds were hopeless, I think you've got to say Wakefield were great. But at the same time, Phil, let me just let me just put this to Phil. You've got. Two marquee players that have signed in Conrad Hurrell and Trent Merrin. Tui Lola here has obviously yeah. come over as another big name signing. Surely Leeds are expecting more than what they've had so far. I don't know. They've played four of the top five teams from and away. Year. I think we're disrespecting Wakefield to start with. I think, mm. you know, Wakefield has spent two years building and getting better mm. every season by having a core of players that are committed to playing for that club that are now playing in a style of play that they understand their coach wants. Um, I think they finished fifth in the last two years, which would put them in the playoffs this year if they only stood still. And I think they're actually getting better. So I think the first thing is let's not underestimate Wakefield's performance. I think the other thing that from an entertainment point of view, and we were talking about why Super League has started with a bang this year on the field. Ten tries at Headingley on um, Friday night, mm. seven of them from wingers. Mm. That's what we want to see. Yeah. And, we'll, now, and I think one thing that Leeds fans will not be patient with, but will understand is that there is a style of play you need to, to have at Headingley to fill that £43 million pound stadium. Do you think, yeah. Phil, that been, will come. Do you think they've been disrupted as well by the new stand development? Absolutely, 100%. It, it, it sucks a lot of air out of the stadium. And when that's up and running and yeah. full, Leeds will come back to possibly to be number one again. And I think and, the, the other and thing... we need that. We want them to be as good I, as they I can I think we, we talk about what we might want Super League to look like. There are city clubs that can draw a certain oh, amount yeah. of people and, and that have access to yeah. corporate facilities that the club will have. Well, just going there, back to Wakefield, sorry. though. Just going back to Wakefield, I think one of the factors behind them is Michael Carter has been an absolutely outstanding chairman and now 100%. chief executive. We were talking about, you know, finances earlier. And, and, and Michael has is, 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 is got the gift of being able to recruit players <laughs> at very reasonable rates mm. and, and at, at, you know, in, in a does. way that ensures that the club doesn't go bankrupt. You know, Wakefield somehow managed to announce a small profit year by year most, most of the time. And the coach and is no mug. The coach is absolutely no mug. They've, they've, I, think, I think we can assume in the next few weeks we're going to find an announcement about the stadium that will be pretty good news oh, for Wakefield. Yeah. Mm. So, so I gather that's from, scoop from so well. Very nearly. Uh, sources tell sources tell me that that might well happen. And hopefully, keep your fingers crossed, particularly for a Wakefield uh, fan. Uh, but you know, if if that can happen, it will give the club a massive boost. Oh, in, in another another, another person who has been very this, just finally on Leeds and Wigan because there is a common denominator here that at the moment they may be in the bottom reaches of league, but the saving grace for both of the clubs and it's happening at both of them again is the quality of young player that's coming through, which will sustain you. The short term, yeah, there is some pain while new signings transition into their surroundings and clubs. But Wigan and now Leeds with, I think, eight or nine other players that beat the Australian schoolboys, their futures are more secure than they have been over a longer term. I would say to everybody here, don't kid yourselves, Wigan and Leeds will roar back at some stage yeah. this season. And my worry is Huddersfield, if we're talking well, about Well, that's what I was going to go on to, Martin. Huddersfield yeah. are the side that haven't won a game yet. They'll be looking at London's results, surely, and thinking, oh dear, well, they're, yeah. maybe they're going yeah. to win a few more games than, than we thought. What, what's going on at Huddersfield? Why, why have they struggled Well, so Huddersfield seem to um, keep on making the same mistakes, giving big money to players who, who, who come in and then don't perform for them. You know, they... They dropped Akila Uate at the weekend, Sorry. having had a you know given him a three-year contract. He's obviously not, not not played well so far for them, and and yet you know you, you've always got this thing about when you recruit from the NRL players who are in their thirties, you're always gambling that they're not going to be over the hill, aren't mm. you? Let's face it. Yeah. And 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 that process happens to different players at different different but, rates. But is it more who they've lost in that they've lost Danny Bruff who? For whatever reason, was always going to be a linchpin. They've lost Jordan Rankin on the opening. But shouldn't week they recruit the to replace? And Ryan Hinchcliffe, who again behind mm. the scenes. But shouldn't they recruit? That's Is that what not their saying. job. Yes, yeah. that's that's the, where I would worry for Huddersfield at the moment. And I, I think I think you. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of those decisions were were made by the club rather than it being taken out of the hands. Well, Danny Bruff's a really interesting case because you know Bruffy. Uh, his, his career has been characterised by moves when coaches have got sick of him. You know, he's, 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 a, he's a very pugnacious character. In other words, a typical scrum half. Yeah. 
you know, Andy, you, Gregory. Andy Gregory. That you, you, you had Alex, dealings with Alex Andy Murphy. Gregory. You, you've, you've got to keep those guys happy. You know, mm. uh, the, the the thing that's crazy with with players like Bruff, you don't lay down any rules for them because you know if you do, you'll break them probably. Um, and and you've, you've got to you've got to take the rough with the smooth. Players like that can win your games, as we saw, as we've seen with Bruffy playing so far this season. So you know, Australian coaches when they come in, they very often seem to have this rather, r- rather, um, you know, a, a highly disciplined approach that doesn't actually suit all our players, does it? No, I, we're I, a different I don't nation. Think. Mm. We're, di- we're a different nation. I, I always remember Peter Sharp at Hull. At, uh, at Hull in 2006. Hull, Hull won the Challenge Cup in 2005 under John Keir. They sacked Keir after a few games in 2006, which seemed very harsh to me. Then Peter Sharp came in from Australia, and in no time at all, he got rid of Danny Brough. Mm. And Hull then spent the next several years, probably, you know, trying to find another, several, one. Trying to find another mm, scrum. Nice. So here's, speak, here's speak the the well, here's a question going back to the Great Britain argument. Danny Brough for Great Britain. Well, the, Scotland the way he's playing at the moment, you've got to say. I mean, he's, you know, you wouldn't think so, would you? Because he's 36, for goodness sake. So, you know, he's got to keep up that form right to the end of the year. That's the question. But you were asking the question about what's happened to we and Leeds. I think you can put that to bed. I promise you they'll come roaring back, both of them. New coach at Leeds, new players settling down. The stadium will open up properly in May. It'll roar. They'll come. Wigan... Probably not going to be number one this year. I think that's mm. gone beyond them now, although they'll try. But again, they'll they'll be up there in the top four. So Huddersfield, your main worry. Is, is anyone willing to change the bet that London will still not get relegated on what they've <laughs> seen so far? London play Huddersfield twice in a month coming up. They're going to be much more significant games than I think we had uh, earmarked before the season started. Yeah, uh, Huddersfield have got some good players, but you know they they don't seem to be gelling at the moment. And you know I do hear that there's a little bit of unhappiness in 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 the camp there. So you know they, they've got to start winning soon, haven't they? And and I can't see many obvious Sean signs Wayne coach of that. Huddersfield. <sighs> uh, Hope to Sean. Um, that would be great, wouldn't it? My goodness, uh, I'd like to see him coach Great Britain. Mm. At the top of the league, Castleford have gone really, really well. They've had, mentioned them, haven't we? No, they've had mm. s- they've had several injuries, but they still find themselves going really strong and winning games comfortably as well. Uh, Morris, what what have you made of of the Tigers so far? Can, can this be the year that they go back to what they did in in 2017 and maybe take Indeed. one step further? Well, number one, I think they've got the best coach in the league. Mm. I think mm. he's absolutely outstanding. He, he he's done it year after year after year, and he doesn't have the biggest international pool of players to deal with so he must be outstanding I think he is um, can they well if you get a roll on in this game you know you're hard to peg back where they've slept up as we know is when it's come to the the crunch it's just not happened for them and if the halfback gets injured it does tend to destabilise them a little bit i make them certainly one of the three. They'll be in the top five, won't they? And oh, no doubt about then that. It's, then, then it's you know all to play for. But I think one of the things about Daryl Powell, I mean, I think he's a great coach, but he's also a great recruiter. They're also a great recruiter. Mm-hmm. You know, look at um, them getting Liam Watts last year. Liam yeah. Watts was was effectively thrown out of of Hull FC. Oh. Mm-hmm. You know, behavioural problems again, which were not you know entirely specified, were they? But but Lee Radford got sick of him and. Couldn't get him out of the door quick enough. So Daryl Powell took him on board. And Liam uh, has been as good as gold, as far as I'm aware, at, at mm. Castleford since good. then. And he's, he's playing great. He's, he's actually leading our Albert Goldthorpe medal. I, th- I think Daryl is the best developer of talent. We've he got is. in Super League where he'll take a Mike McMeekin uh, or he'll take an Alex Foster or he'll take mm. a Chris Clarkson mm. and, and get the very best out yeah. of them. I think that's where his strength really lies. And that if he does have injuries, the people that come in know exactly what he expects from them. Mm. And he makes them feel 10 foot tall. Like Michael Shenton resigning yeah. a new contract is important for them. Gives that general on the field that he... But do you remember at the start of the season, another interesting thing really about Castleford, at the start of the season, they went on this um, training camp to, to the Canaries. <laughs> and apparently some of the players had a bit of a bust up and ended up with fisticuffs and so on. And um, bothered, everybody said, oh, you know... What's gonna, you know, it's it's a disaster for Castleford. It's, you know, what's gonna happen now? With your inside knowledge to Wakefield's new stadium, 
<laughs> can he get Castle for a new stadium? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, surely that's what we we need them to have to kick on as a as a Super League entity. I've got to tell you uh, before we go, a quick story, only thirty seconds. I took Dave Whelan to his first game ever at Castleford <laughs> and um, we were a bit late uh, because the car park man wouldn't let us on the car park. <laughs> Nothing's changed. Eventually, we eventually got in and uh, so I'm desperate for a cup of tea so I went to the lovely lady, I know her very well, She's, she, she might not be there now, a lovely old lady and she had this big old fashioned 20 year old big metal teapot. And, uh, you got 20 seconds Morris. <laughs> I said, can we have a cup of tea? She opened the lid, she looked at it, said, how many of you? I said, two of us. Oh, I'm not, not making a fresh pot for two. <laughs> <laughs> and Dave thought, I, I'm sponsoring the bloody league and I can't get a cup of tea. <laughs> so please, Castle, let's have a new stadium. Well, thanks for that, Maurice. That's all we've got time for on Rugby League Back Chat. Don't forget, you can get all the information for everything that's happening on this channel by simply going to www.freesports.tv. Thanks to all of my guests. We'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.